Welcome to the Downtown Chamber Series. This is our first digital program. Due to the pandemic, uh, we've had to have this program video recorded so that you can watch it at home. Typically, our concerts are held in art galleries in downtown Phoenix, featuring visual art and live performances. We did have a concert this week uh, at Park Central Mall, hosted by Artlink, a sister arts organization that's been critical to help us uh, navigate this pandemic era. The concert was held outside to a socially distanced audience. All of us wore masks, but the big challenge was how do we do art? We don't have walls to hang paintings. So Artlink was able to find a sculpture artist for us, Alvin Harris, and also John Ebinger, a wood artist, to provide some amazing uh, art for us to be amidst the concert. We've, at this video now, we're also going to uh, have a brief inside look into the craft of these artists, how they uh, create these metal sculptures, and also John Ebinger, how he's created his wood music stands. Take a look. At first, I was just kind of enamored with uh, old school techniques. So I was actually into blacksmithing. But then they were doing a night pour in, uh, in brass. And if you've ever seen brass, when it's molten, it has this opalescent color to it. And then just seeing, like hearing the power of the furnace and then watching it being poured, I was like, how do I get some of that? And my first pour was, uh, was a reaction mold, which is basically, instead of being like in ceramics or sand, um, I was encasing wood in sand and then pouring iron into it. And that was probably like, it was a very intense introduction to um, casting metal. My particular process, I start out digitally. So I'm designing it in Rhino 3D uh, for those pieces. And then, um, then a robot kind of carves it out of foam and then I create a mold out of that and cast it in wax, right? And then that is put into a ceramic shell. The wax is melted out, and then it's filled with metal. So it's multiple steps, and then putting it all together is, is a whole bunch of welding. It's all the same up to the point of actually getting the parts put together. The welding techniques, like you could use MIG welding or, or TIG welding. Um, with, uh, with the iron, uh, but with aluminum, copper, and bronze, uh, it's all TIG welding. In terms of finishing it, bronze is just, that's just the ideal metal to work with, in my book. That's really just a journey of me just liking a form, right? I just see it shows up in my work over and over again. It's been pointed out by some of my instructors. People think of it as paisley, but you can follow that form into the yin and yang shapes the way they complement each other. But I'm interested in those kind of uh, seeds of culture. Just like if you were to get into fractals, fractals they're always talking about, they have like a primary shape that's iterated over time. It's self-replicating, but it creates beautiful forms if the Mandelbrot's fractal, for example. Um, and it's basically, it's just an iteration that creates a visual like language and so I like that. And so in this situation, it's basically the, the, the larger form is called, um, is, the, is based on the intersection between two circles, where the edges, of the, the edges of the circle meet the center of the opposing circle. So then these, the intersection of them is what some people call um, phi, right? And so I, I, I combine that kind of seed with another object that I'm always, you know, interested in, which is paisley leading to like, yin and yang. So if you look at it, it's basically the same object like yin and yang that are like complementary forces or the union of two um, forces. I'm really lucky. I'm able to dabble with a couple of uh, realms of artistic expression, one being the symphony and one being the woodwork. The symphony is, it's, it's a great artistic expression and I, I love it and I miss it a lot these days, but it's, it's limiting in a way, you know, I'm just a, a cog in the wheel, uh, like we all are as, as orchestral players, but I come into my wood shop and it's all personal creativity and I can just let loose out here and it's all me and I'm not part of the, the big wheel. So this is where I really get that creativity out of my out of my soul you know and I have a lot of fun out here doing it I've always been really fond of 
of lines and angles and structure and engineering and, and how things fit together and how they all work. And uh, probably 20 years ago, I, I, I had a dream. And it was this, this uh, cube, this uh, geometric cube. And I came out the next day and I made that thing. And that propelled me into what I'm doing today. I like to conceive and build things that, that I haven't seen before. And that's what kind of keeps me interested. And after I created that first little block, uh, it just kind of went from one thing to another, to another, to another. And, and that's how it has progressed all these years. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress. I'm, I feel like I'm evolving artistically all the time. I feel like I have a long way to go, but that's where I'm at right now. It's a big process. Lots and lots go into these stands and there's, you know, every one that I make is a little bit different from the last one. It's, and again, it's a evolving process. You know, it, it first comes from a concept and I've, you know, I've done many prototypes trying to figure out my angles and all that kind of stuff to make it work. I try and deviate from the typical angles, 45, 90s, you know, of course we have to use those at times, but I generally kind of gravitate towards the prime, the prime number angles. Uh, and these stands here are an example of that. This is, this is belt all with, uh, there's some 90s of course, but they're mostly 11 degree angles and 19 degree angles. The balance and the function of them all came through a kind of an empirical process. You know, it started with, you know, a, a basic thing I threw together and I played with the angles, how I was leaning forward, the height, all the adjustment, all that came about through this process. Well, wood is a, I, I love wood. It's, 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 you know, as far as I'm concerned, the, the perfect medium. Selecting the music for this COVID era program was challenging to say the least. It's difficult tightrope to walk between following all recommended safety guidelines and still being able to provide a live concert. The musicians needed to rehearse for a month, so we had to pick colleagues that were comfortable with in-person exposure. We held all of our rehearsals outside on the driveway of the Andereg's house, strategically scheduled during the nap time of their baby son to minimize interruptions. Since our instruments are not amplified, outside there are no ceilings or walls for the sound to bounce off of. Thus, balancing sound is a big challenge, as well as communicating to each other through face masks at a distance. But after many months, I guess all of us, this is starting to feel strangely normal. As for the piece we chose, we could have selected a, man, a mainstay such as Bach, Beethoven, or Brahms, but for the complexity of this time and the desire to have a short program for safety reasons, we chose Benjamin Britten. Born in England in 1913, Benjamin Britten's life straddled the effects of both world wars and profound changes in the arts. His mother, an amateur singer, recognized early on that Benjamin would be a great musician. He started both piano and viola at a young age and then followed the traditional path of English prep schools. This education environment, however, exposed him to many difficult things which developed his nonviolent pacifist beliefs, leading to his conscientious objector status during the war. Britain's viola teacher opened the door to his creative genius by exposing him to concerts of new music by Ravel, Holst, Bartok, Stravinsky, and Frank Bridge, the contemporary composer who, who was able to take him as a composition student at age 14. Britain's contemporary interests contradicted the old guard English composers, many of whom were reluctant to lend ears to new musical developments. Britain's focus was on developing keen ears for sound before subscribing to a theoretical idea, such as 12-tone or serialism. He focused on sound, color, and clarity. The String Quartet No. 2 was written in 1945. Famous, uh, that was the same year that Britton embarked on a tour of Germany as piano accompanist for the famous violinist Yehudi Menuhin, during which they visited the aftermath of the war and some of the concentration camps. This piece explores extreme ranges of our instruments, gypsy-like solo outbursts, disjunct layers of our parts, which require a lot of rehearsal, and serene clarity of sound and color. The last movement, which is longer in length than the other two combined, features a chaconne, which is a repeated series of slow-moving bass notes, 
which he explores in a myriad of ways. It's an homage to Henry Purcell from the 1600s, whom Britain revered. It's a blend of an old technique with very modern ideas. Leonard Bernstein uh, described Britain aptly. When you hear Britain's music, you really hear it, not just listen superficially. You become aware of something very dark. There are gears that are grinding that don't quite mesh, and they make a great pain. But like many of Beethoven's works, this piece also embodies a clear vein of hope. And we feel the piece is a very appropriate soundtrack for this time.
All arts organizations, large and small in our city, have experienced a precipitous fall in financial support during this crisis. Concert cancellations translate directly to no ticket sales. Donations stop when there is nothing to attend. And staff and artists are furloughed or laid off. Any support that you can offer in the coming years as we emerge from this situation are critical to the arts organizations that you love and rely on in our great city of Phoenix, Arizona. Thank you.